Good morning. So uh, we have been studying various attributes of God this fall in the Psalms, and this morning we're going to be pondering our God of justice. Now, being just is as much as a part of who God is as all of his other attributes, but I don't think generally it's quite as comforting for us to think about God's justice and his judgment as it is for us to think about his other attributes, such as you know, his goodness and his compassion. But the fact is that we can't really comprehend God's grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. We can't really understand how much God loves us unless we also understand that God is perfectly just and that his divine judgment is real. I'll flesh this out a little bit more later, and I'll talk about how God is actually being just in cleansing us from our sin and seeing us as righteous. So last month, Christina taught us that God actually delights in forgiving us because he wants to pour out his love and his mercy on us, and so that we, in turn, can love and serve him. A little bit later, I'll also talk about what it cost God himself to do this, to deal with our brokenness, so that his justice is satisfied while we are forgiven. So to begin, let's take a closer look at God's justice, which is intertwined with his divine judgment and his wrath. And God's wrath, it can really be seen as the outworking the outworking of his unremitting opposition to sin and evil. And we can see in our psalm today how closely tied together God's judgment, his righteousness, and his wrath are in verse 11, where the psalmist declares that God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. And when we describe God as acting justly, it's important that we understand that he's not He's not being influenced by anything outside of himself. He's not conforming to some standard that's outside himself. He's simply acting out of his very nature. Just is something that God is, and so God will always act justly. I mentioned earlier that God's justice is intertwined with his judgment. The way that theologian A.W. Tozer describes this is God's divine judgment is that when God judges a man, he brings justice to the moral situation which that man's life created. The truth of God as our judge is found again and again throughout the Bible. The Psalms that we're studying are filled with verses about God as our judge. In Psalm 7 that we're looking at today, the psalmist writes, let the Lord judge the peoples. In Psalm 19, verse 9, the psalmist declares that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And in Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes that God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. In addition to these verses about God as our judge, the Old Testament is filled with stories about God's divine judgment. In Genesis 3, God judged Adam and Eve, and he expelled them from the Garden of Eden. Later, in Genesis 6, we can read how God judged the corrupt world that existed in Noah's day, and he sent the flood to destroy it. In our study of Exodus last year, we saw how God judged Pharaoh and sent the plagues against the people of Egypt. There are other stories in the New Testament as well about God's divine judgment, and more importantly, the entire New Testament is filled with declarations about a day of coming universal divine judgment. J.I. Packer notes in his book, which is about the attributes of God, how important it is that we understand that God is just and that one day he will sit in divine judgment. Here are some of the reasons that he lists. The final proof that God is holy and righteous and just and everything else that goes into making him morally perfect is the fact that he's committed himself to judge the world he created. It's because God is just and because he will sit in divine judgment that every wrong will eventually be righted and every person will one day come before God's judgment seat. 
And it's this truth that gives moral significance to our lives. A just God who sits in judgment is why good will eventually triumph and while, why evil will finally and decisively be gotten rid of. And finally, a just God who sits in judgment is what ensures that God's will will be done in the end. So remembering those things, that in the end, God will sit in judgment, that good will triumph, and that his will will be perfectly done, I think, I think that can help us with a couple issues that we all face over and over and that can be problematic, uh, hard to navigate sometime. One issue is wondering where God is. Where is he amidst all the sin and evil and social injustice that surround us in the broken world that we live in? Sometimes it can be easy to start wondering why, you know, why God doesn't deal with people or situations that are obviously terrible and bring justice to them now. This is actually one of the main questions that's posed in the book of Jonah. The prophet Jonah is angry that God doesn't want to seem doesn't seem to want to bring justice to the extremely evil Assyrians in their capital city of Nineveh. The book ends with God asking Jonah. God says to Jonah, "Why shouldn't I be concerned with these people?" And I think the implication and the lesson is that we all should be grateful that God still cares for sinful people people like the Ninevites and people like us, even when we were his enemies. We should all be grateful that God is willing to show compassion and mercy even when it's not deserved, when it doesn't seem just. And then there's the book of Job. As this story begins, God himself describes Job as a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And right after that, God allows Satan to cause Job tremendous suffering. And it, it kind of doesn't seem right. When you read, read this part of the story, it doesn't seem like God is being just to this good man. And as the story unfolds, a suffering Job debates three friends about whether God is truly just. And eventually, Job confronts God directly about his own suffering and all the injustice in the world. And then God shows up in a whirlwind, and he makes it clear that Job and his friends have only their own narrow human perspective about just what a world run on the principle of perfect justice would look like. And we learn that what may appear to be divine injustice to Job has to be seen in an infinitely larger context. We learn that God, in his perfect wisdom, is running the entire complex universe, and that it's not yet time. It's, it's simply not yet time in his larger plan to bring perfect justice to our fallen world. And at the end of this book, God asks Job, and by implication, he asks all of us as well, to simply trust in God's perfect wisdom, in who he is. And Really, that's why we're studying the attributes of God this fall, because the better we know God, the more we know him, the more we can trust in him, even if we're experiencing injustice ourselves or see it grow in the world around us. This simple and yet profound idea of simply trusting in God is what Job ultimately learned, and I think it can help us when we really can't understand why. You know, why a just God is allowing evil and sin and social injustice to flourish all around us in our fallen world. It can help us when we feel like the psalmist when he cries out in verse 9 saying, Lord, bring an end to the violence of the wicked. Make the righteous secure. So I think that's one issue. Another issue that I think can be problematic for us is that since we know that God is a God of justice, then what should our role be when we see or experience things ourselves that are unjust? And I think our response as believers has several parts. First, we ourselves are always called to live justly, no matter what everybody around us is doing. So, for example, 
we should always be honest when we're filling out our tax returns. Even if we know that a lot of people aren't, and even if we know that that means that they ultimately pay less tax than they should, and maybe that means we pay more than we should, we're still called to live justly in that regard, in that instance. Second, if some injustice is being done to us, just like David in this psalm, we can take refuge in God. And remember that in the end, it's really only God's opinion of us that counts. And we can know that we can leave things in his hands and that eventually, in the end, justice will prevail. David takes this posture in the very first verse of Psalm 7 where he says, Lord my God, I take refuge in you. And then third, we do live in a broken world. And that means that we're going to be continually confronted by individual situations and broad issues of social injustice. Acting justly ourselves includes being willing to take a stand against any injustice, even if that means it could cost us something. On this point, Dave Gunlock told me that in the Bible, God's justice is often described within the context of his care for the most vulnerable groups of people. People like widows, orphans, and the poor. People who most often experience injustice themselves because they're so easily taken advantage of. So acting justly ourselves also means that we should use our time and our resources on behalf of the people who are most vulnerable to injustice. But having just said that we need to act and speak out against injustice whenever we encounter it, when it comes to actually sitting in judgment on other people, even if we believe that they're acting unjustly, it's really important for us to remember that judgment and retribution belong to God. We can hate their sin, but it's not our job to judge the sinner. Here's what Tim Keller said in his commentary on this idea. Uh, he said in his commentary on Psalm 7, only God has the wisdom to know what people deserve as well as the power and the right to give it to them. So anytime we're tempted to climb into the judge's seat, uh, we need to remind ourselves that it's not our job to judge other people. That's God's job. And it's probably also a good idea for us to remind ourselves in those moments about everything that God has forgiven us for. I found this slide on Pinterest, and I think it does a good but humorous job of capturing this idea. Don't judge somebody just because they sin differently than you do. As believers, we should live with the posture of humility because of that, remembering that we too are broken sinners. And we can't possibly know everything there is to know about another person's situation or begin to comprehend what God's plans for that person are. But this staying out of the judge's seat, it's really hard to do because it goes against this funny thing in human nature, which is that we really want God to bring justice to the world at large and to everyone else, while at the same time, we need and we accept his mercy and his forgiveness for our own brokenness. David is actually a really good example of this. He wrote Psalm 7 that we're studying today during a time in his life when he was being unjustly pursued by King Saul. And so in this Psalm, David asked God for justice. He asked him to bring judgment to his situation. But as we all know, later in his life, David has an adulterous affair with Bathsheba. And he even arranges for her husband Uriah to be sent to the front lines of a battle so that he'll probably be killed, which will free David up to marry Bathsheba, whom he's gotten pregnant. Then David writes Psalm 51, in which he asks God for something very different than his justice and his judgment on David's situation. In that Psalm, David asks God for compassion and mercy and for God to literally blot out his transgressions. The fact of the matter is, if God judged each one of us simply based on our thoughts and our actions, we would all deserve nothing but condemnation and wrath. 
thankfully, as believers, even though we know that we can never deal with our sin on our own, through faith in the atoning work of Christ, we're actually made righteous in God's eyes. This, this concept of God crediting us with righteousness through faith in Christ is what John is teaching in this verse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here we can see that God is actually being just when he cleanses us from our sin. His, his divine response didn't come because his mercy and his love somehow outweighed his justice. Instead, God's response is actually grounded in his justice because his justified wrath towards our sin is fully satisfied when we acknowledge our sin and put our faith in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Here's what Tim Keller says on this point. Because of the cross, God can be both just towards sin and yet mercifully justifying to sinners. The sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, it didn't change God. He never changes. He's always perfectly holy, perfectly righteous, and perfectly just. What the atoning death of Christ did change was our moral situation. As Tozer explains in his book, when God looks at an atoned for sinner, he doesn't see the same moral situation than he sees when he looks at someone who still loves their sin and who doesn't understand that they need a savior. When an unrepentant sinner turns their back on the grace of God that's offered to them through Christ and refuses to let themselves be saved, a perfectly just God will judge this person and God's perfect justice condemns this unrepentant sinner to die. But when God looks at someone who recognizes that they're a broken sinner who can never be right with him on their own, someone who accepts the atoning work that Christ did on the cross, God now sees this person as righteous because their sin has now been paid for. And so God's perfect justice is satisfied here too. God's plan of salvation is underpinned by his grace, which is why he freely chose to save and redeem us by giving his son to die in our place and pay the price for our sin. In God's grace, it works in perfect harmony with his justice and his judgment, as well as with his mercy and his love in his plan of salvation. So this morning I've talked about God's justice and divine judgment and how a God who is perfectly just can also be perfectly loving and merciful and forgiving. But besides a better understanding of this theology, I mean, what's, what's the application here for our lives? I mean, how do we take this particular knowledge about God and turn it into a deeper love for God? In his book on prayer, Tim Keller says that forgiving sin was the greatest problem that our just and holy God ever faced because sins are similar to debts that have to be paid, and our sin was like this enormous debt that required an infinite payment. And the only way that God could forgive us was to bear the payment himself. The way Keller describes this is grace was God's response to the problem of his holiness and our brokenness, and that Jesus is the channel through which his grace flows down to us. Oops. Keller goes on to say that there are two key aspects of God's grace. The freeness of his forgiveness to us and its astounding cost to him. And Keller points out that if we don't really understand the freeness of our forgiveness to us, that that could lead to continued feelings of, of guilt or shame for past sin instead of liberation from its power over us. So if there's something in your life that you're still struggling with, some sin from your past that you keep thinking, you know, I don't know if God could really forgive me for this, I would encourage you to rest in knowing that you are forgiven 100% the moment that you acknowledged your sin and accepted the work that Jesus did for you on the cross. 
As Christina said a few weeks ago, the word forgive means to let go. You can let go of any shame or guilt from your past sin. God's forgiveness is complete. But Keller also notes that if we don't really understand the costliness of our forgiveness to God, that that could lead to just superficial, shallow repentance and, and confession, and not to a real change of heart and a real desire to realign our lives with God. And this is just as important. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I, there's been more times than I care to admit that I'm in the middle of doing something or saying something or thinking something that I know I shouldn't. And in, in the middle of it, or right afterwards, I think to myself, well, God will forgive me. And he will. But that sort of cavalier attitude ignores the tremendous price that's attached to my forgiveness. Here it is. A cavalier attitude toward my own sin, it cheapens the unbelievable sacrifice that God made so he could forgive me. So this aspect of God's forgiveness is also really important to remember. So in closing, I would encourage all of us, either in our small groups this morning or um, at home for those of you who are listening remotely, to really think about how a perfectly holy, just, and righteous God found a way to forgive your sins so he could shower you with his love and his mercy. Really think about how the freeness that was so, the, the forgiveness that was so freely given to you was so costly to God himself. And as you think this truth out with your mind, the goal is to think it into your heart so that you come to know God better and to trust him more. So instead of closing in prayer this morning, I'm going to put up a few verses from Psalm 103 to for you to ponder that encompass these ideas, and then Stephanie will come up. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Whoops or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Sherry, thank you so much. I felt like that was a lot to tackle. Um, for me, as a kid growing up, God as judge was scary to me, but for Jesus. And um, thank you for again reminding us of the cost involved, because it was not um, a light gift. He was a father who gave his son, which is remarkable to me, to me particularly once I became a parent to understand the sacrifice. And it's interesting thinking about justice because that's such a politically charged word right now, depending on what it's attached to. And I think we need to take a page or two or all of it from the Bible um, to realize um, that we're not called to judge. We are not called to exact justice on other people um, because with that often comes vitriol and pride and anger and hate. And we're seeing that a lot in our news these days. And so um, I loved that uh, in Micah that we're not only called to act justly, which as you said is to be fair and equitable and right and righteous, but we're also called to love mercy, show compassion, and to walk humbly with the Lord. And I really think we're called to that posture right now because only then will we have true reconciliation. So thank you again, Sherry, just for all your time and all your clarity on this. As far as announcements go, we have Operation Christmas Child is due back November 15th. So if you can remember, bring your box, pack it up, and um, there's a table inside, or Diane, I'm sure, will handle it for you. Also, we have kind of a neat thing coming up. A group of ladies uh, at Grace have put together a one-day guided silent retreat. 
and it's going to be uh, the first Saturday in December, December 5th. And I have to admit to being totally lame. My girlfriend, um, Pam Cashin, and Jackie Redberg are doing this. And I said, the first Saturday in December, <laughs> I need to get my life organized and, you know, be shopping for Christmas gifts. And I love Pam. She goes, Steph, how about setting your heart for the Advent season? <laughs> Wow, what a novel concept. Shows you how lame I am. Anyway, so I'll be there. Um, it's going to be December 5th, uh, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's going to actually be at Jackie's house. And it's, they're limited because of social distancing. So there will be 25 ladies who are welcome to come. However, they will also be doing a Zoom silent retreat that day, which is kind of nifty if you want to participate in that way. Anyways, if you are interested, go to the Ladies of Grace page and you can sign up there. And if you have any questions, either ask me or if you know um, Jackie or Pam, ask them. Uh, this is not under Christina's purview, so I'm kind of give her a break. Um, and then also, um, oh, no, that's it. Lastly, oh, just have a great time in your small groups. Okay, wonderful week. <laughs>